Okay, we're looking at the various views of the Sermon on the Mount. Last time we looked at two, the humanistic, which said that the sermon, many of the principles are outmoded, outdated, have no relevance for the complexities of modern society. We answered that. The liberal view, which uh, the social gospel movement, for example, used the sermon in an attempt to reform society without first regeneration. You can't have reformation. And now we come to the interim ethic view. The humanists, the, the liberals, such as social gospel, and now Dr. Albert Schweitzer proposed this view. A lot of people were really affected, influenced by this man who was neo-orthodox, liberal. Everyone thinks a great Christian, but he wasn't. He did what he did for self-righteousness sake. But uh, I don't care to go into Albert Schweitzer. Uh, you listen to this view and you'll get an idea of his view of Scripture. He held that the New Testament of course, the Sermon on the Mount included, was largely an interim ethic. Christ and the apostles, he said, taught purely an eschatological concept. Might as well learn that word now. Yes, yeah, I will. Let me spell this word, eschatological, just like it sounds. That word means end-time events, things dealing with end time. In fact, in biblical theology, we'll be studying eschatology. That would be the last thing we study in biblical theology. So he held that Christ and the apostles taught purely an eschatological concept. That is, that the end of the world was near. That's all they had on their mind. The end of the world was near. Schweitzer held that they did not teach principles for permanent morality and conduct in the world. Sermon on the Mount does not teach permanent principles of morality and conduct. But temporary principles to be used only in the short interim between the ascension and Jesus' almost immediate return. It was to be used in the short interim between the ascension and the second advent. That the Sermon on the Mount, as well as the New Testament, does not set forth permanent principles of morality, but they are temporary ones to be used in the short interim. He, like others who hold this view, said that Jesus and the apostles were wrong. That it's been 2,000 years, so it didn't work out. Jesus, he said, thought he was coming back right away. And of course, they'll cite you scriptures, you know, like, be ready, the Son of Man comes in an hour when you know not, and so on and so forth. He said the sermon superhuman righteousness. The sermon teaches superhuman righteousness. The sermon super, superhuman righteousness, the call to love your enemies, the command not to resist evil, the call to renounce the worldly goods, the world's goods, command against divorce, not taking an oath, not going to court, he said all this was impossible in permanent practice, so it was only for the interim. Well, I think if anyone's read the Sermon on the Mount, they know it's impossible without the Holy Spirit, which Schweitzer didn't have, so he tried it and he couldn't keep it, so men who can't keep it have to invent theories of why they can't. That's why the fundamentalists who are non-charismatic either put it at first advent or second, but there's nothing for now in the sermon for us. Well, we reply to this uh, 
erroneous view that Jesus and the apostles, the apostles do teach the imminent return of the Lord. They do teach the imminent return all through the New Testament, but that's the basis for demanding such a high ethic. That's the basis for such a high ethic in the sermon because you know not the hour when he returns, so you better live like you'll be ready, is his point. Secondly, if it's impossible on a temporary, on a permanent basis, it's impossible on a temporary basis. So he got out on a limb and sawed himself off. <laughs> All error is really that way. They get out on a limb or get in a corner they can't get out of like hyper-Calvinism. By logic, hyper-Calvinism can put you in a corner and you can't get out. Sovereignty of God is true, but hyper-Calvinism is not biblical. So if it's impossible on a permanent basis, it's impossible on a temporary basis. That ought to be obvious. Then the dispensational view, there are actually two of them. There are two under the dispensational. Now there are two premillennial views, dispensational views, probably we ought to call them rather than premillennial. And one is that the sermon was applicable only to the first advent. Christ offered the kingdom to the Jews. Had they accepted, these would have been the laws of the kingdom. Second view is just the opposite, of course, or the other swing of the pendulum. It's the laws for the millennium. That, and so it's the second advent view. You either hold to one or the other. Second advent, that the sermon is not applicable now. Jesus uh, just wanted to get a complete revelation in print, so he gave it back then. And we're to carry it for 2,000 years or however long it is before he returns, and there'll be the laws for the millennial kingdom. They don't say it that way, but that is a little ridiculous to think that he would give such heavy spiritual teaching that has no application at all until the millennium. Now, a proponent of the First Advent pew view is Dwight Pentecost. Dwight Pentecost. Familiar to any fundamentalists, of course. Dwight Pentecost, who wrote Things to Come. Very good book if you know how to take the meat off the bones, not choke on the wrong doctrines. It's a good book with, with reference to source material for end time events. Things to Come. Uh, but like any book in your library, you have to use discernment. He, said, he says in his book, because of the teaching of the sermon concerning the presence of evil, presence of one's enemies, persecution, that the sermon is, for, is not for the millennial kingdom because you won't have enemies and persecutions in the millennium. But it applied to Israel only at the time of Christ when he offered them the kingdom at the first advent. Of course, they rejected him, as you know, and that made the sermon of no effect. So to Pentecost, it's just in there. We've got Matthew 5, 6, and 7 that he can cut out of his Bible. He doesn't need it. Now, he has never thought that through either. He got through he, because he believes in the inspiration of Scripture, that is, in the doctrine of it. But he got himself out on a limb and sawed it off. Because if it has no application and it's in the New Testament, something strange. Now, some of the Old Testament ceremonial and civil laws would have no application. All right, the second Advent view. That's still dispensational. And an example here would be Ellis Schaefer. Schaefer, C-H-A-F-E-R, Schaefer, 
C-H-A-F-E-R. I haven't used some of these old fundamentalist names for so long, I forgot his pronunciation, but it is Schaefer, I'm sure. C-H-A-F-E-R, not Schaefer. That the sermon has no relevance for the present age, but it's a code of ethics that will prevail in the millennial kingdom. He says, fulfillment of the sermon in the present age is impossible. You see, all of these men are non-charismatic. A man without the Holy Spirit should stay away from Matthew 5, 6, and 7 because it, he will have to do one of two things. He'll either become so frustrated that he gives up or he'll develop a view that it's not applicable to his situation because the sermon makes no concessions to weakness like the Old Testament saints were allowed, makes no concession to complaints or people uh, making excuses that they make to pastors and counselors. God doesn't take those. Uh, some people sometimes think we're pretty stern or harsh in statements we make like that, but God is a lot less uh, patient with Christians under grace who are baptized in the Spirit that are always backsliding or making excuses because, well, that's my weakness. There, you read the Sermon on the Mount, friends, there are no concessions to stubbornness, weakness, obduracy, or anything else. So Schaefer says that the uh, sermon is, uh, its fulfillment is unintended and it's impossible. Of course, fundamentalists, dispensationalists have a rigid distinction between dispensation of law and dispensation of grace. So he tells us that Christ's teachings in the Gospels apply only in some cases to the present age, and in some cases only to the kingdom age. And it's very hard to follow fundamentalists because they're always dividing up uh, things in dispensations that the New Testament, Christ's teachings in the Gospels, as well as the New Testament, some of the teachings apply only to the kingdom age. And you have to know by their literature and you'll find out what they are. He said all Christ was doing was setting forth the nature of the kingdom and the laws by which he would govern it in the millennium. He's just getting it down so the record will be complete. He was showing us the nature of the kingdom and the laws that would govern it in the millennium. He said as a rule of life it was addressed to the Jew before the cross and to the Jew in the coming kingdom. It is therefore not now in effect. Systematic Theology, Volume, volume 5, page 97 and following. <laughs> it's not now in effect so we can skip the sermon and go on to other things but the thing is that isn't all there is to be said he says and the extreme dispensationalists say that that the Beatitudes the sermon is legalistic and that the Beatitudes is a system of works for the Jew in the millennium yeah blessed are they that do this and that and the other. He says, you see, you have to do certain things to be righteous. And he says, we already have obtained righteousness by grace. And that the Jew in the millennium, this is a uh, system of works because he was under a covenant of works and it'll be restored in the millennium. And that the Beatitudes and the sermon seem to be a pattern of works necessary to attain to the kingdom. Well, we reply to that with a few remarks. One is, the Jews never were and never shall be saved by works. You'd think anyone that would bother to write a book would know that much if he's ever read the New Testament. You're never saved by works. And there's no higher spiritual truths and principles set forth in all the Bible than in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the sermon. How could he call that a system of works? when they turn right around and say it's impossible, nobody can keep it. The spiritual truth is so high, you see the lustful glance, the anger, 
Those are principles much higher than the system of works that he talks about. Jesus says, if you're angry with your brother, you violated the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Now that's a higher principle than the law, thou shalt not kill. It's dealing with the motive, with the heart, with the attitude. And again, we can say the New Testament contains all the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount. That can easily be demonstrated, and we probably will when we look at the sermon. But you can find all of the teachings in the sermon all through the New Testament, almost word for word in many cases. Therefore, if the sermon is legalistic, then the whole New Testament is a covenant of works. It's ridiculous when Jesus said, uh, tells us, thou shalt not tell a lie, that that's works, if you don't tell a lie. <laughs> Again, it pays to know Old Testament theology because we'll see that righteousness is doing something. You do righteousness in the Old Testament. And so when God commands us to do something or not to do something, that isn't works. It is proving that you are justified by faith because you do righteous works. Otherwise, James 2 applies and your faith without works is dead. You just talk faith, talk Jesus, talk salvation, but you don't have it. No one will ever convince God that they're saved who does not have a fruitful life. Churches are filled with people who are not in the kingdom. Wait and see. If that offends anybody, wait and see. They're calling him Lord, but they're just spectators in Christianity. They're not doing anything to prove righteousness. And that isn't works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 tells you the, the order. You're saved by grace through faith, not of works. But God has created us unto the doing of good works, which he has ordained that we should walk in them before the world. Ephesians 2, 10 goes with Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. So anyway, the New Testament teaches the Sermon on the Mount, passage after passage. So if the sermon isn't applicable to, for today, then we can ask certain questions. Is there a single teaching in the sermon that a Christian can ignore and still call himself a Christian? What could you ignore? Is anger justifiable? Because the fundamentalist says, Dispensationalist says that the sermon is for the first advent or for the second advent, but not for now. Is anger justifiable? In other words, if all the principles are applicable and can be found in the rest of the New Testament, then why labor to say the sermon is not applicable, if you follow what we're saying? Is the lustful glance justifiable? Because some men or women can't avoid it and say, well, that's an impossible. Is hate of one's enemies justified because it's easier to hate your enemies than love your friends, and so on. So what principle in the sermon, if you want to go home and read it again, could you ignore and still say, I'm a citizen of the kingdom? So what we have is not a legalistic teaching, but the the spiritual nature of the sermon is its own witness that it's the highest revelation in all the Bible of how a Christian is to live under grace. See, Jesus even contrasts the legalistic that is the legislation of the law with his teaching in the sermon. Over and over he says, you have heard in the law, but now I say to you. And so he gives us the inner meaning of the law, the spiritual intention of God. You know, one couldn't miss that if they would just bother to read the New Testament. That he's actually doing what they say that the sermon isn't teaching. He's actually contrasting the law with his teaching, his principles. You've heard that thou shalt not kill, but I say unto you, if you're angry with your brother, you're in danger of hellfire. John makes it a little plainer in 1 John. He says, you're a murderer you hate your brother. Now that's scripture. 
That's the same John who recorded John 3.16. You're trusting. You can't believe him in John 3.16 and not believe him in 1 John when he says, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. Where did he get that? From Jesus in the sermon. Then thirdly is the biblical, well, fifthly is the biblical view. Biblical view. What I call the biblical present age view. This is the one I taught in the seminary as being the obvious one. In fact, I didn't know there was any other views until I got in seminary, got to reading, and so on. It's amazing what you can discover that the Bible is teaching after you get to biblical, after you get to Bible school or college or the seminary. Just by reading the Sermon on the Mount, it never occurred to me not to believe it and try to put it into practice. Oh, yes, it was difficult because without the Holy Spirit, it's quite frustrating. Every time you get your little house all built and your life in order, something happens and it all comes tumbling down. <laughs> what is it? Why? And so on. Fourteen years of that, and finally the Lord, in his mercy and grace, said, you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's, that's still valid for today then when you receive the baptism, you find out why you couldn't keep the sermon, because you need the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Yes, you do. That's why he said we are to have it. It's to you, Acts 2, 38 and 39, to your children and all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord your God shall call. The baptism and the tongues are for them. And anyway, as I was saying, it never occurred to me not to uh, think it was applicable as I felt Matthew 1, verse 1, all the way through Revelation 22, and what's the last verse? Anybody got it? Anyway, 22, 21, I thought it was. All the way from Matthew 1, 1 to Revelation 22, 21, I thought was applicable until I read all these views. And I had further reason to know that the sermon was for today because uh, I applied Matthew 6.33. Been walking on that going on 24 years. Seek first the kingdom of God and you'll never have to take a thought for material needs. I think I've said in your present once, presence once or twice, I wouldn't know what it is to take thought. I wouldn't know what it is. I walked on that through college and seminary when everybody I met said it wouldn't work, including my family. Not my immediate family, but my relations. And so it comes as a surprise to me if Matthew 6.33 still works and God provides my material needs abundantly, as he says, he will if we trust him, why the rest of it wouldn't work. Of course it works. The present age view. The ethical requirements of the Sermon on the Mount are the highest expression of morality in the Bible. We want to make certain statements, and that's one. The ethical requirements of the Sermon on the Mount are the highest expression of morality and conduct in the Bible. Secondly, the Sermon has application from the time it was given until the second advent. Sermon is applicable from the time Jesus sat on the mount and gave it until the second advent. Now, before we take another step, I want you to open your Bible and see we've got Bible to prove that. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is the sermon. So look at Matthew 7, which is the close of the sermon, beginning at verse 21. Now, how men can read this and then say it has no application is beyond my comprehension. Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. All right, so you've got to do his will. All right, let's 
jump down to verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine. What sayings? The sermon he just gave. Whoever hears them and doeth them, I will liken unto him a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon the house, but it fell not because it was founded upon these teachings. And everyone that hears these things of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat upon the house and fell, and great was the fall of it. How could it be any plainer? If he hadn't said it, it's plain enough. But he says, not everyone who calls me Lord, but he that does the will of my Father, and there's the revelation of his will. He just gave it. Amen. You better find out whether or not it's for today and start obeying it. If he says not to take an oath, I don't care what the courts of the land or the politicians or Christian leaders and friends or the whole world says, I'm not taking an oath. He says, swear not, because he said, I've got to do that. And you, you don't know of a Christian who wouldn't laugh at that. Oh, what are you going to do when they call you into court, what he said? He said, don't swear by heaven when you lay your hand on that Bible. That doesn't sanctify it. That is violating what he said. That's by heaven. That's swearing by heaven. That's close you're going to get now. So he makes no concessions to our willingness to compromise or follow the principle of expediency and do what everyone else does or want to avoid ridicule and laughter. If he says that it, when he says, if they take your coat, give them your cloak also, he means do that. And he tells you to love your enemies, to pray for them, to do good. It's do righteousness to your enemies so that you can be the children of your Father in heaven. In other words, if you don't do it, you're not. Well, that's what he says. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, is in the kingdom, but he that's doing these sayings of mine. And he's the one that builds his spiritual house on a rock. And the ones who don't and those who teach not to do it are in worse judgment because James chapter 3 tells us, don't many of you out there seek to be teachers because we have the greater judgment, the greater condemnation. Oh, I'd love to teach and have all those people sitting out there and absorbing every word I say and all. Well, you better think twice. You better me be sure what you're teaching. Amen. Because we have the greater judgment. It's better to preach a sermon twice than to make up one that isn't based on the word. Say, folks, I just didn't get a revelation this week. I worked and labored and prayed, but you're going to hear what we had last week, and I don't think you've obeyed it yet anyway, so let's... <laughs> Which would probably be true. Because most would plead, even if they had the right intention, I didn't have time. So uh, it would be like someone said about our tapes, and we say this to make a point, because it could be true of your messages too, probably is, that we listen to those tapes 35, 40 times, each one, till we glean everything from it before we go to another. Well... You might be surprised what you hear even the second time. Someone said, well, what about the 10th? Well, by the time you get to the 20th, you may know what's on the tape and be able to put it into practice. That's why we've got four Gospels that say essentially the same thing. That's why Jesus over and over repeated himself. One woman said to me, you're repeating yourself. I said, I know it. That's precisely the method of teaching in the Bible. Repetition, repetition, repetition. But of course what she meant was it wasn't fitting her ideas of what she wanted to believe and it was a little rough on her spiritual sensibilities because she had lost some friends over coming to our church and I was to blame because I was coming on too strong, they said. I said, is it the word? Yes, but we can't live it. Not that way. Well, anyway, Jesus said, I didn't make that up. You just saw it. If you didn't bring a Bible, you heard it. Faith comes by hearing the word. That if you do these things, 
that I've just said, then you're children of the kingdom. So that means that as he gave it and then finished the sermon, I want you to obey these things or else it's just words calling me Lord. You're not going to get into the kingdom by calling me Jesus, Lord, Savior, going to the altar, weeping tears. That's all a part of salvation, but if it stops there, he that enters the kingdoms, he that does these things, we better pray for the grace to turn the other cheek or to give up the cloak or coat coat or whatever it is and not run to court because somebody quote is suing us unquote that's a part of the blessing he promises you persecution part of the preparation is persecution John 15 Acts 14 22 we must by much tribulation enter the kingdom so why run from the pathway it's by tribulation What's the way? You say, look for the road sign that says tribulation and trial. You're on the way. (laughs) That's so hard to find, uh, somebody says. Well, that's because it's narrow. And straight is the gate. Well, anyway, friends, our flesh may not like to hear it as that woman's flesh didn't, but uh, it's true nevertheless. Well, you don't have to raise your hand to fir- affirm. That would be taking an oath, yes. So you're swearing by heaven. That's what that signifies. You never point that way, unless they're Satanists. But the very fact you raise your hand, put it on the Bible, that's revelation from heaven, then you swear by raising the hand that is calling on heaven, what he said not to do. See, they didn't carry Bibles around in their courts those days, or he could have made it more specific. But unregenerates calling upon a Christian to tell the truth, well, we're going to be dealing with that in the Sermon on the Mount anyway when we get to it. But unregenerates in court, and most of them are, exceptions only prove the rule, calling upon you to lay your hand on the Bible to swear you'll tell the truth, why people do that every day and perjure themselves and lie. That that, that doesn't guarantee you're going to tell the truth. That That only sanctifies in the eyes of the jury the fact that you may tell the truth. (laughs) <laughs> and so a criminal, a criminal, he uses that as a psychological advantage. He wouldn't, uh, only, only a foolish person like a disciple of Jesus would refuse to take an oath. And somebody says, well, what if? Uh, what if they say, I'll put you in jail? Then that's a part of the privilege of obeying the Lord. But you can thank God that you're living in a country where they will allow you to affirm. So just say, my word as a Christian will mean yes and no, which is what Jesus said. Let your yea mean yea and your nay mean nay. He said, anything else you do to swear you'll tell the truth is of the evil one. Pretty plain. He said, blessed is the man that hears these things and doeth them. You can see why they put it first, second advent. Because who do you know? And the leaders of the schools and the seminaries and the churches will sit and argue with you over this because they don't want the, to pay the cost of having to condition their lives to it. It's that simple. I think I've said also to you, in all of my teaching in the seminary, now I say this just to bless God, but they would flock to my classes and say, this man has really got a message. And if I'd preach in the church, students would come and say, won't you come and be the pastor? You know, they need the pastor in the the seminary church. But when I got into teaching ethics, I lost my following. (laughs) uh, Because this is where it's at. I told you when we started this course, you have to study the Word of God, but this is the most important course you'll take because this is going to put into practice what you're learning. And we're just dealing with principles. We haven't even started practice yet. Praise God. Even those who supported me 100% came to me with questions and shake their head. You know, they, they want to believe, you could tell they wanted to believe it, but they couldn't accept it. Not to agitate when you know the politician or your president or the leader is wrong, why we have the right of protest in the Constitution. I said, Constitution gives you a lot of rights that God doesn't. <laughs> Constitution lets you get drunk in your bedroom, but God won't. Well, anyway, the sermon, thirdly, is how a Christian is to live under grace in a sinful world. The sermon is how a Christian is to live under grace 
in a sinful world. It takes grace, of course. He doesn't anywhere in the sermon say it's easy to turn the other cheek. He says, turn it. Now, anybody that says it's easy, well, he's already broken one of the other commandments, hasn't he? <laughs> Hardest thing in the world is, and he's talking about a literal slap in the face. That's the hardest thing in the world to endure. That's why you don't have to beat your children with a baseball bat. Just smack them on the cheek and they'll learn quickly how to obey you. The seat of the pants is designed to sit on. It can take a lot more than the cheek. And so when Jesus said, turn the other cheek, that's hard to do. I'll tell you, I was slapped in the face once by a man I worked all day for for a dime and didn't get the dime when I asked for the dime he slapped me in the face. I wasn't a Christian then. I was too young to hit him back, so. <laughs> I didn't turn the other cheek. I just turned my back and walked off. Of course, he missed some cookies, bananas, and Cokes, but that's before I was saved. <laughs> well, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend you go and do likewise, but uh, he, didn't, he didn't gain anything. He was unregenerate, and so was I, but I got paid. And I got paid in other ways. The Lord paid me, too, for that. Praise the Lord. In the millennium, in the millennium, righteousness and peace will prevail. Now, on the basis of that, in the millennium, righteousness and peace will prevail. On the basis of that, I want to show you that the sermon is not for the millennium, but for now. It's very evident from the sermon itself. In the millennium, peace, prosperity, righteousness, will prevail, there be no war, no sin, so on. And so from the sermon itself, if you'll turn there, I'll show you that it's not for the millennium. It has to be from, for now, for the, for the very uh, reason that Jesus, in his statements, assumes evil and things are present. For example, unrighteousness is present. Now you can write these and then we'll read them. Unrighteousness is present. Matthew 5, verses 6 and 8. Now that couldn't be in the millennium. Unrighteousness is present. Matthew 5, verses 6 and 8. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. In other words, only those few who are searching for it. Obviously we're in a time when not everyone is. And verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Strife is present. Strife and war present. Verse 9, Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. Well, you won't be making peace during the millennium, obviously. They should be called the children of God. Persecution is present. Whenever the sermon is applicable, persecution is present. Verses 10 to 12. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Well, very obviously it could not apply to the millennium. Corruption and moral darkness are widespread. Whenever the sermon is applicable, these things are true. Corruption, moral darkness, widespread. Verses 13 through 16. Where there he tells us to be the salt of the earth. See, salt has a preserving influence. So we as Christians are to be a preserving influence in a sinful world. He tells us to be the light of the world, let our light shine. So corruption and moral darkness are widespread. Christians are to be salt and light in such a situation. Divorce and adultery are practiced, verses 31 and 32. 
It has been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say to you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Now you won't have that in the millennium. I, I don't understand how people can read the sermon and say it applies to the millennium when in when they're writing on the millennium they tell you all about the peace and the righteousness and all that prevails. They can't seem to put it together. Christians still suffer abuse from their enemies during the time the sermon applies. Verses 38 to 44. Christians still suffer abuse by their enemies. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say resist not evil. That means evil is present. And so on. He tells you to pray for your enemies and so on. Pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. So Christians are suffering abuse. Religious hypocrisy is present. Matthew 6, 1 through verse 18. There he deals with the giving of alms, the fasting, and the praying to do it before God and not to uh, advertise your giving of alms and your fasting and so forth before man. So he speaks about religious hypocrites here, and we're not to be like them. So obviously it is a millennium. Satan and his temptations are still present. Matthew 5:37. Matthew 6.13 We are to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Well, you certainly wouldn't be praying that in the millennium. So the tempter is still present. Jesus is still absent, and he won't be absent in the millennium. Jesus is still absent. Matthew 6.17 and 18 with Matthew 9, 14, and 15. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not to men to fast, but unto thy Father which seeth in secret, thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee. Now, he says, when you fast, you won't be fasting in the millennium because he tells us we won't over in chapter 9, verses 14 and 15. We only fast while the king is absent. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? They're asking this of Jesus. And Jesus said, Can the children of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the day shall come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they will fast. So he says in the sermon, when you fast, that means he's absent. Because he says we don't fast when he's present. Why would you fast when he's present? They didn't fast at the first advent when he was present. They're not going to do it at the second. You better believe it. They'll be feasting. He says, I'll, I'll gird myself and, come and, and you sit you down and come and serve you in the kingdom. Hallelujah. He's going to sit us down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob at a big table. That's what he said. Materialism still competes with God for the Christian's allegiance. Materialism still competes with God for our allegiance. Verses 19 through 34, chapter 6. Of course, you know the teaching, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust does corrupt, and so on. And then on through five times, it says, Take no thought for your material needs. Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all of these material needs will be given to you. So he, said, he says here in verse, verse 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. You cannot serve God and mammon materialism. So that's still present, competing with man's allegiance for faith in God. Again, we are urged to seek the kingdom, Matthew 6.33. How can we be in it and still seeking it? That ought to settle it. Shall we stop there? No, I got one more for you.
<laughs> but that ought to solve it. Matthew 6, 33, seek the kingdom. How could you seek it if you're in it? See, if the sermon is applicable to the millennial kingdom, well, I think you see it. But how about Matthew 6, verse 10? What are we told to pray? Thy kingdom come. You wouldn't be praying that in the millennium if you were in it. Well, praise the Lord. I hope all you visitors believe in the millennial kingdom because we're not trying to prove it here today. That's taught all through the word, that Jesus will reign and rule on earth. If you don't know that as the truth already, read the book of Zechariah, 14 chapters, especially get into chapter 14, says he will be Lord over all the earth one day, and all the nations will go up to worship him. Well, I had one more, but already gave it to you, and that is the last admonition in chapter 7 where he says, do these things. So that ought to settle it. He says, do these things. So that shows it's applicable for today.